Welcome back to Buckeye Talk. Doug Lamarice with Nathan Baird and Stephen Means. We're doing a top 10. We are ranking the 10 most important Buckeyes for the 2023 football season. Now, what does important mean? I think it's two different things. One is you're going to be really good, but you're so good, you have a huge effect on the team and their success. And the other is, well, you might be pretty good, or maybe you're not guaranteed to be good. And the gap between if you're really good or if you're not get that good would have a great effect on the Ohio State Buckeyes in 2023. It's it's imprecise. It's sort of two things at once. It's certainly not the best players, but there are some very good players. And it's not just players. We also put some coaches on this list. What we did is I, we came up with 20 that I sent out to the texters, and I had the tech subscribers rank them in order, one through 20. Then Stephen came up with his own list of 20. Nathan came up with his own list of 20. I came up with my own list of 20. I combined those. So there's four votes. Three hosts, one texture vote. And we created a top 10 out of that. This podcast, we're going to talk about numbers 10 through 6. Another podcast will deal with the top five. But we're also going to talk about some of the people that did not make the overall top 10 that we had individually within our top 10s. So these are the people that just missed. It doesn't mean they're 11th or 12th or 13th. But people that got a top 10 vote that didn't make the top 10 overall list. And Nathan, one of the outliers for you, this is actually the person who had the highest individual vote that did not make the top 10 overall, was Jordan Hancock, who was number five on your ballot, Nathan, but he did not make the top 10. Why did you view Jordan Hancock as the fifth most important Ohio State Buckeye for this season? Just because it seems like having a second cornerback that is that reliable and reliable is maybe a tricky word. That sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm not expecting, I'm, I'm looking for adequacy. I'm not, I'm talking about a, a cornerback who can be relied on to do all the things that you expect a starting cornerback at Ohio state to do. And they haven't had two of those for so long. And so I, I could, I listened to an argument that, that Denzel Burke should be even higher. Uh, but I, we've seen more of it from Denzel Burke. We still haven't seen any of it from Jordan Hancock and, and you could, I guess, just as easily say Davis and Nick Benoson at this point as Jordan Hancock, but, but Hancock was with the first string all spring. And if they can get a second cornerback who really steps up and has a presence, I think it could be a transformative thing for this defense that now you have a second guy who's taking away other really good receivers. You have a second guy on the outside who is making a difference in stopping the run. I just, again, that a, a consistent presence out there. And yes, we've talked before about it maybe being a, a three-person share, and that's where Igbenosin comes in. But we also know the way I, – I bring this up a lot as we're talking about players. Like, how are they talked about by the coaches? How are they talked about by other players? Hancock had a little bit of that before the injury just wiped out last year. And that lost year – contributed to what that defense was or was not. And if he can actually apply that this year, I think it could be a, a huge part of whether this defense is about the same as last year and, and still playing in that at that level, which may not be good enough for this Ohio State team, or does it take that leap that we've been waiting for it to take now for a handful of years? Potentially big gap here. If we are talking about Jordan Hancock as a candidate for the Marshawn Lattimore Award, which is, hey, you never really played, and now you're like all Big Ten, All-American level. Wow, that's a ceiling. Versus never really comes together. He doesn't even start because he's hurt or whatever. There's potentially a very big gap here. Steven, you had Hancock, I believe, 15th, and Davison Igbenosin 16th. I had Hancock 16th. And one of the reasons I didn't have Hancock in my top 10 is, well, like, what happens? Let's say, okay, what happens if he's really good? There's some real upside for this defense, Nathan, as you said, if he's really good. What happens if he's not really good? Well, then maybe Davis and Edby Nosen plays more. Or maybe Jair Brown plays more. Or maybe Ryan Turner plays more. Like, I don't, I don't know that there's a cliff if it doesn't go well. But, Steven, you kind of had Hancock and Igbenosin right next to each other. How did you sort of view those two? together in a list like this 
I'm I'm sold on the three man thing at this point, just because I mean we've seen enough just injuries the last couple of years with that cornerback room that you probably just need to have three, even if Denzel Burke is your best three. I, I think we do a thing during the season midway through where we rank the best players. I think we do offense and we do a defense. I am sold that I think all three of these guys need to be amongst the top ten or top twelve defensive players for this defense to really be what it needs to be because it just opens the door for everything else. The, the idea, the sack thing, is it, are the defensive, is the defensive line not getting home or do they not have time because the coverage has been so bad or is it, you know, it, it's all these different factors that need to come together simply because the cornerback play is better. And I wanted to emphasize that with my top 20, that their third best corner still needs to be one of the 12 best players on this team when we rank them, because I think it emphasizes just how much better that group is this year and just how much that raises the ceiling on what's possible from a play calling standpoint, from a, 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 a coverage standpoint and everything else, all of the above. So I wanted to make that point. That's why I wanted to pair those two together because they're probably, if anybody's not coming off the field of those three, it's probably Denzel Burke. So I wanted to keep Davis, Igbenosin and George Hancock together, but I did want all three of those guys to be among my top 20. Okay. Steven, you had a Mecca Abuka sixth on your list and he did not make mm-hmm. our top 10. Why did you have a Mecca as high as you did? We don't know about quarterback yet, and we're not going to know until they play somebody good. That's just how this works. We don't know about the offensive line situation, and we're not going to know until they play somebody just in general. That's normal. So when you have all these variables, it took me back to something Brian Hartline said before the 21 season when we were going through that quarterback battle, and he was talking about how you know, Chris and Garrett especially needed to be that much better to make up for the gap of inexperienced quarterback play and all those other things. That Chris and Garrett literally needed to be – coming into that season and be two of the five best receivers in the country and they needed to play like it. And I applied that same logic here with Marvin Harrison and Emeka Ibuka. Until we know completely for sure what Kyle McCord or what Devin Brown is going to be, until we know what this offensive line is going to be, Emeka Ibuka and Marvin Harrison Jr. need to be the best possible versions of themselves week in and week out until we feel comfortable about what's behind them. Cause those are the best two offensive players probably. And they need to play like it every single week. And that's why so my list was a combination of, you know, uh, you know, value amongst their own position, but then also who needs to be the best possible a plus version of themselves week in and week out for Ohio state to do what it needs to do this year. And I think a Mecca book is one of those guys as a person who some people think might be the second best wide receiver in the country coming into this season. Nathan, no, nobody else had a Mecca that high. You and I had him pretty low in the teens. The Texters had him pretty low in the teens. Why, why did you not have a Mecca as high? Part of it is uh, he might be the second best receiver in the country, but the best receiver in the country is also on the roster. Uh, and also just that uh, I, I don't – he's a known quantity at this point. He is kind of – his performance at that level – is sort of baked into my expectation of the team. So maybe that's why I don't see either way a lot of variance in what happens. And I suppose even if something were to, bad were to happen and he couldn't play for an extended period of time, there is still a confidence it, for me that somebody else can step up and and hang. Um, you've got Xavier Johnson there. You're going to have Brandon Ennis there. So, um, but really, it, I think it's more the other thing that I just said, that that I, I think of Ibuka and what he does, and what he does kind of in orbit off of Marvin Harrison Jr. as already just sort of a, a baked in part to, I, I don't see a lot of variance in what the offense does based off of that. Okay. This is, this is a guy that, did not make the top 10 kind of for one specific reason. Trevion Henderson. I had him eighth. Nathan had him eighth. The Texters had him pretty up there. The Texters had him uh, 11th on their list. Steven, you did not have him in your top 20, which is why he didn't make the top 10, because he got zero points from you. Why did you not have Trevion in your top 20? 
Travion probably has the best upside of any of the backs in that room, but I think that's more of a game by game conversation. If we were having a who's the most valuable player if they're playing against Georgia in a college football playoff game, he probably is in my top ten because then you're, it's a lot of upside. That's a really deep room that at least four of those guys we've got some level of faith in can get it done week by week. I mean, it's probably the deepest room on the offense, maybe even on the team at this point coming into the season. It's at least the deepest room Tony Alford's had since he's been here. He even said so. And because of that, I think it when the guy when two, three, and four, the gap isn't as, you know, wide as it maybe would be in some other places, I think it chips at Travion Henderson's value because just I don't know if they need Travion Henderson on a week by week basis the same way they need other people on a week by week basis because some of the stuff that they're gonna ask Travion to do, Mayan Williams can do it, Dal Hayden can do it, Trainum was a running back against Michigan. So his my lack of ranking him had less to do with him and more of a salute to I have just as much confidence that Mayan Williams, Dallin Hayden, and Chip Trainum can help them get through the season, even if it still means when they get to the best games, you still want the best the the highest upside on the field. Nathan, why did you have Trey in your top 10? It's it's sort of the opposite of the Abuka argument for me. I know we got to see Trevion uh, more or less unleashed and, and healthy and everything as a freshman. But last year we didn't. And I, I there is more variance in what this offense does this year based on whether Trevion Henderson hits his ceiling or approaches it or if he doesn't. And if he stays healthy or if he doesn't. And... I, I agree that it's a deep room, uh, but nobody else in that room has ever really been evaluated across the sport with the upside that Trevon Henderson has. So I, if he is that, if he can take the next step off of what he showed as a freshman, then I think it does elevate what this offense is capable of. And it absolutely helps take pressure off of the quarterbacks and off of an offensive line that is still coming together and may still be a work in progress when the season starts. Uh, there, there's Now, there's legitimate questions as to whether that's something Henderson can really instigate on his own um, because he's such a, a weapon out in space, but what does he do to help himself get out in space? That's a very unknown at this point going into this season, and I think that's a, a legitimate criticism. But again, if he figures that out, how much does he enhance his own value and how much more dangerous does he become as a runner? I think if Ohio state had Bijan Robinson or Jameer Gibbs last year, healthy, they would have won the national championship. And so I think there's an upside to the run game that it's not just, is their run game deep? Is their run game? It's like, what if their run game, what if the guy who carries the ball a lot is awesome? What does that look like? And I think Travion in that room has the best chance to be that. And what would that do? I think it would greatly enhance the chances of this team winning it all. If they're, if the, if when they hand the ball off, they are just as dangerous as when they throw the ball. And I think Travion and Henderson is the answer to that. Doesn't mean they can't be solid with Mayan Williams and, and it's occasionally great with Mayan Williams. And it doesn't mean that they can't be functional with Dallin Hayden and Chip Trainum. And even though they got to the Michigan game last year and handed the ball to a guy who's supposed to be a linebacker and he played pretty well, you also saw what Donovan Edwards did. And it was like, okay, well, Chip Trainum played pretty well, but man, they could have used Donovan Edwards in that game. And so that's why I've trained the top 10, because I think he has a chance to be a difference maker. And I think that difference can be the difference between winning it all and not winning it all. So there are, but he's, you know, the running back is not the only person that contributes to the run game. So, I, you know, that's a run game discussion beyond just a running back discussion. But that's why I did have him there. Nathan, another guy you had in your top 10 who didn't make it was, sorry, my call. You had him ninth. He did not make the top 10, Nathan. I mean, of course you had him ninth. So, <laughs> should we just, can, uh, can it's the only ninth. Just play the clip? Yeah, I'm surprised he was that low. <laughs> From Nathan, can we just go to the Hall archive? the bus archive, or do you want to do it fresh? Just do it fresh. <laughs> I, I I don't remember if I submitted that before the, the Taiwan Malone commitment or not. But again, it's still just an upside argument. We saw last season, as much as guys like Ty Hamilton and Tyleek Williams have, have done some good things in their career, the upside that Mike Hall actually played with, like the the, the, the impact that he actually had on opposing offenses was tangible. 
and you did not get to see it sustained throughout the season because of the, the shoulder injuries. And we don't know. I, I think you're right about you may very well be right about if, if if Ohio State had had that kind of alpha running back that it maybe is that's a national championship team. But if they don't have the injuries they had on defense last year, maybe it's a national championship team too. Maybe that makes a difference. Like there's a fully healthy Mike Hall make a bigger difference against Georgia. He play more against Georgia or Michigan. There's a fully healthy Jordan Hancock make the difference. And I know every team has injuries, so that's – but you know what I'm saying. So I, I that's the reason why I still look at him. I'm looking at a guy who – has flashed something special, done it against real opponents, Notre Dame, important games, and now it's just a matter of can he replicate it? If if he replicates it and expounds on it, now you're talking about it a potentially really special season. All right, my call did not make it. Steven, your number seven was Cade Stover. And I will say Cade Stover on the list of 20 people – that I sent, and again, we sent some coaches, some players. Cade Stover was 20th of the 20 that I sent to the Texters. And I was a little surprised that Cade Stover was that low. Why did you have Cade in your top 10, Stephen? The Georgia game told me why Cade Stover. I mean, he left the game. That's a good answer. A lot. I think that's a good answer. <laughs> like, <laughs> And nothing has changed. We still, nothing has been proven with Joe Royer and G. Scott and you know Sam Hart and been a Christian in the rest of that room, but we know Kate Stover is going to be pretty quality as a blocker. And as of last year, he might be a part of the pass game. Now, some of the reason he might've got some of the passes is because you've got a second year quarterback who's more comfortable making those throws. So we'll see if his stats stay similar to what they were last year. But I mean, Kate Stover is the only proven commodity in this tight end room. And I mean, he might be one of the five or six best tight ends in the big 10 and they like to run 12 personnel. And like, I, I'm long rambling here, but the answer is literally just the Georgia game is why Cade Stover is one of the top 10 most valuable players on his team. I, I do think, like, what if they just start, like, Kate, and Cade Stover is not so established. What if they throw him the ball in September and, like, he just drops a bunch of them? And it's like, okay, like, he mm -hmm. had a good first year, but maybe he really is just a defense first kind of guy. All right, well, now maybe you can't throw the ball to the tight end on third and six. That's just not an option because can you throw it to G Scott? Can you throw it to Joe Royer? Are you going to give Jelani Thurman minutes that matter? Like, I, I do think, Nathan, this is an opportunity. Or what if Cade Stover, like, takes the next step and it's, oh, I think Cade Stover is, like, a top 50 NFL draft pick. Like, he's a force. I think those gaps are at least reasonable to ponder, and I think those gaps – would change the fate of the Ohio State team. And I say that, Nathan, as someone who I did not have Kate Stover in my top 10, but I had him like 14th or something. But I do think the idea that, you know, just the, the quality of your backup factors into a discussion like this. And certainly, Nathan, as Steven said, we see that at tight end. You do, although the one thing I would push back a little bit on is that, that, that nothing has changed since the Georgia game. And I brought up many times how, how, how conspicuous his absence was there, but that was because Joe Royer had not played all season and G Scott was not available for that game. He did not play because of injury. Now, if both of those guys are healthy throughout a year, that, that does change that scenario somewhat. Um, and, and I think it would be a different scenario this season, especially because no Mitch Rossi, those guys will play more, be more experienced if the same situation came up. But I, I, I still think it's a, it's a valid argument that, that Steven is making. And I struggled with where to put him. I think I put him even lower than you did, Doug, because he's another guy that and I wouldn't make this argument. I think there's maybe two guys on the roster I'd make this argument about where the intangible impact that he has on the identity of the team weighs heavily. And I think legitimately, I don't think that's like a coach speak thing or an imaginary thing. I think he just his attitude and what kind of pours forth from him every game. And it's a lot of stuff that we don't see. Fans don't see that. I think affects how that team what that team is when it puts hands in the dirt on Saturday afternoons all right one other guy for you Stephen that didn't make the top 10 Tommy Eichenberg that you had eighth on your list Stephen was lower for a lot of people again I think it's it's hard to get it's not how good the person is right that's not mm -hmm. what it is. it's how important they are and so I actually had Tommy Eichenberg 20th on my list because as good as he is 
I thought, well, what if they had to play Cody Steinman? Like his thumbs fall off. It was a terrible the thumb. The thumb surgery went wrong and he's thumbless and he just can't play. You got to play a linebacker with thumbs. So, or they are, I I, we don't like to talk about injuries. Yeah. Aliens, <laughs> aliens abduct just his thumbs. They just <laughs> de-thumb him. And you see these two thumbs like floating up to the spaceship. That'd be funny. Does it blow a hole in the defense? Can they not do what they want to do? Or could Jim Knowles take Cody Simon or move Steel Chambers to Mike and play CJ Hicks or do something and then use that linebacker in a similar way to Tommy Eichenberg? And we're not saying this is not how good you are. It's the impact. It's would it blow a hole in Ohio State season? Would it how much would it damage them? Whatever. You felt it. Obviously, he's really valuable to what they mm-hmm. want to be. Why did you have him in your top 10, Steven? The more I looked at that list, the more I feel like I may have overcompensated because I probably wouldn't have had him on the list at all coming into the season last year. It, it's it, For me, It's I, I think the good part of it, it would have made me put him at like 18 or 19, just off raw talent alone. And I'm glad you used the example of like, would they just do the same thing with Cody Simon or still champions? Well, they have it. You know, that, I, Jim Knowles saw something in Tommy Eichenberg that nobody else has seen and has turned him into a weapon. And that is always intriguing to me. We're seeing it now with like Lathan Ransom a little bit, but these guys, if you start listing guys off of like your, your defensive or offensive coordinator should be turning this guy into a weapon for your unit. Who would you name? I don't know if just, if you looked at the raw eye test of guys, Tommy Eichenberg would be among the top 10 defensive players that Jim Knowles should be turning into a weapon, but he did. And he didn't necessarily – everybody else was within the scheme. Now, he sent Cody Simon on some blitzes every so often, but that's because you send linebackers on blitz. He turned Tommy Eichenberg into a level of a weapon that, regardless of what his talent level was, it worked. And that he's literally a staple of what Jim Knowles wants to do with this defense. And so you have to honor that, even if, you know, you don't necessarily – think he's maybe he, he he might not be one of the most talented guys but for what Jim Knowles wants to do with this defense Tommy Eichenberg gives him an opportunity to maximize that in a way that we haven't really seen him do with other linebackers yet and now that can change this year especially if he decides to put CJ Hicks on the field more if he plays Cody Simon more in a little bit of a rotation situation but right now the only guys that we've seen him use purposefully as a weapon it's maybe only two or three guys and Tommy Eichenberg's one of those players and he is a talented guy. I mean, he, he's yeah. a sideline to sideline linebacker. He's not just to stick his head in the hole and tackle a running back kind of linebacker. So he is a really good player. The last guy, and by the way, shout out to the Texters. The Texters top 10 was the top 10. So there's nobody on the Texter list that didn't make the top 10. So they know what's up. All three of us went a little bit wild off the board with a couple. And the last one is the guy that I had 10th. And I, I guess I'm not surprised. I had Sonny Styles 10th. And the reason I have Sonny Styles 10th is because I'm looking for extraordinary talents on the defense that regardless of the scheme, regardless of what the offense wants to do, he just might show up two or three times a game and do a thing. And if I'm trying to list the guys who are most likely to be that, even if Sonny Styles does not have a starting role early in the season, who's the guy that might just jump a route on Sam Hartman in the Notre Dame game? Who's a guy who just might fly up and make a tackle on third and three? against Western Kentucky, right? I just I just think his talent gives him a chance to be a difference maker in a way that's different than other guys. Doesn't mean they don't have other good players. But that's why I elevated that of what's the difference between who, 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 we saw him a little bit in the spring game, right? Like he jumped that route over the middle of the field. Like, man, that almost looked like a pick six and that could have been six free points. And what if that happens against Penn State? What if Sonny Styles makes a play on Drew Aller that nobody else would make a nobody else in the safety room would make that play? Because maybe, you know, he he just read something, he has the speed to get there, he's physical enough to get in that kind of thing, Nathan, that possibility. And what would that mean on a defense where as much as we talk about scheme, we're also just looking for some dudes. We did a whole defense dude podcast. So I put him 10th on my list. Because he's high on my dude list, and I think a dude or two, new dudes especially, would have a chance to change this season for Ohio State, Nathan. No, I think you're right, and I think myself and, and maybe the Texters too might have been too influenced 
not by what that talent breaking through could mean, but also, but instead maybe how we perceive whether that talent's going to be given that opportunity um, mm-hmm. for I, I, how to better describe that. You know what I mean? Like we still just don't know what his role is going to be. We still don't know. I, I think what you're describing is what we've always thought that this defense should eventually evolve towards, which is it, it's not positionless, but it's like he's playing Sonny Styles. He's playing. He's just the, he's on the field and he's making plays. And who cares what you call him? And I that that would seem to fit within what Jim Knowles has constructed here. But right now, as we sit here, it's hard to say for sure. Is Sonny Styles on the snap for the first play against Indiana if Indiana is not in twelve personnel? I don't know that today. I think it's very possible that if we were doing this in the middle of August, which we might do some exercise like this in the middle of August. We've got a lot of pods to fill. Uh, he might be higher on my list because we'll have more information at that point. I, I agree with that. It's not, I don't think the conversation with Sonny anymore is capability. It's opportunity. And we're not like, I don't know how many snaps he's going to play per game. Cause we know he's probably got that strong nickel safety role. Cause he's, they've been doing a lot with that 12 personnel, but is he going to play 15 snaps, 20 snaps, eight snaps a game? So because you don't – he might yeah, he could very easily do something in those eight snaps that makes you go, he probably should be playing more. But that's, you know, that's a different conversation than, like, can he do something? Yeah, I will say, though, benefit of the doubt maybe should be given to this defensive staff because I don't know if we came out of last year thinking, oh, they're just not playing the right guys. Like, I feel like guys yeah. got opportunities last year when, you know, the Josh Proctor, Lathan Ransom thing happened – there's other examples you could talk about. The fact that they had Mike Hall in there so early as a redshirt freshman last year and playing a big role. Like, they're, they're, you can point to ways where this defensive staff maybe didn't seem as hesitant to make some of those calls as previous staffs were. So may, that should probably maybe be further evidence to lean towards where you are and where the – right now, Doug. I do, I do like that idea, Nathan. We'll do a note. We'll do this podcast again. Maybe we should just find like 20 topics and just do those same 20 podcasts every month. It's like, oh, it's the 18th of the month. It's time to do rank in the top 10. And then it's just like, what's the evolution of thought? It's like, hey, 30 days ago we thought this, but now we still think this. <laughs> we'll try it. We'll try it out. It's the 29th. Okay. So it's the 29 best players in the Big Ten West re ranking. Mm. Uh. <laughs> Uh, Cade McNamara moved from 28th to 26th in the last 30 days. 26th with a bullet. So um, Caleb Brown is third. Uh, we Ohio State's ninth best receiver is the third best player in entire division. We will. Uh, that's who didn't make the top 10. So now we're going to get into our top 10. And we're going to do that next on Buckeye Talk. Doug Nathan Steven, you know, if you want to be part of it, if you love surveys, and I know people do, 614 350 3315, you sign up for a two week free trial, bang, you're in. We send you a survey, you vote, and then you get to see how you think compared to what other educated, dedicated Ohio State fans think, and plus what we think. So we, we couldn't do this kind of thing without the texter's input. So we appreciate that. And we would welcome you to join that if uh, you're not right now. All right. We did include coaches and there are coaches who made our top 10 including at number 10 and some of this is difficult because as we were sort of putting this together nathan you and i were just hashing out a little bit we have the right names on the list it's like well how do you balance this player or this position needs to be good and as a heads up we grouped the quarterbacks together because to try to be like, well, Kyle McCord's third and Devin Brown's seventh. It's just like, I just felt like that's not kind of what we're trying to do here. So quarterback, we just did as a position, the quarterback. And right tackle, we did as a position. Because when you add Josh Simmons from San Diego State into Zed Mahalski and into Tegra Shibola, and then you're trying to say, well, I had Tegra Shibola 12th and I had Zed Mahalski 15th and I had Josh Simmons 18th and whatever. It's like, again, that's not exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out, do you think the right tackle is going to be good enough? But those are the only two places where we did positions. Everybody else was an individual player. But Justin Fry is 10th on our list as the offensive line 
coach who has to get somebody or somebody's ready to play left tackle, right tackle, and center, Nathan. So what do you think of the idea of Justin Fry making this top 10? And how would you describe why he's important to this season? I mean, it's it's critical. I mean, he's got to find – he has to both continue the development at three spots at least. Not that Donovan Jackson and Matt Jones aren't trying to get better, but but three positions where you have to bring people up to sort of the baseline of – of production of, of play that Ohio state expects. And then you've got to make the right decisions as to who those guys are at the end of the day. Like you've got still three starting decisions to make. Even if we think Carson Hensman is the leader at center, it's not like anybody's come out and said, that's his job. So I it's, I was talking to you about this as we were kind of formulating the list. Sometimes we get a little too caught up in the, well, Justin Fry wasn't here when this problem started. He wasn't the cause of why, the talent isn't right in the offensive line room, but he was also hired to fix those problems. And we're now going into year two. So it's, this is, it's not like he got to the end of last year other than with Whipler leaving, but that had to be seen as at least some possibility for them. And it's not like they got the end of last year. We're like, all of a sudden, Oh my God, two, we need two tackles to play. Like they knew that that was coming. And so this is the second year of the project that started the day he was hired. And we now will see the fruition of what he was able to do. I know he's, it's only based on what was there and what he was able to bring in through the transfer portal. But we'll see whether he was able to meet that challenge and take what Ohio State had available to it and, and at least get enough out of it to keep this offense going. It can't be – we can't get to the end of this season. It would be a real, I think, injustice if you got to the end of this season and we're like, well, all those receivers stayed healthy – and Trevion Henderson looked like he a new man, and boy, they got the quarterback decision right. But Ohio State lost two regular season games because of the offensive line. Like, and I'm not predicting that, but uh, you, they, that is among the outcomes that I think are on the table. I think, like, if you think about it, was Greg Stoudrawa one of the most ten, ten most important people? for Ohio State's success at the end of his career here? And the answer is maybe yes, right? Because part of well, the reason, right? And so, because the other mm-hmm. thing, and it's hard because I mean, we're talking season. about 2023. Yeah, I mean, like it's, you know, well, okay, there were some things that weren't happening that that needed to happen, but yet then they also, they developed Dewan Jones and Luke Whipler had to get ready when Harry Miller didn't play and there were good things. Like there was a lot that like really relied on the offensive line coach. And there's part of this, you know, Justin Fry, as we've talked on the podcast, needs to, you know, probably get a big win in recruiting. And that doesn't directly affect 2023 for a list like this, but it's an important part of Justin Fry's job and he's really important. So the Texters actually had him higher than anybody. The Texters had him sixth on their list. None of us had him quite that high, but we were all kind of in this range, Stephen. And I will just tell people, he's the only straight up position coach in the mm-hmm. top 10. Does it make sense to you, Stephen, that he is in a discussion like this? Yes. I think the only reason he was out of my top 10 is because he's not a coordinator, and I have both coordinators in my top 10. But I think he is in the – it's not hot seat. That's not the word. It's the most put up year, put up or shut up year, simply. And I'm throwing the recruiting part of this in here because Nathan's right. He didn't cause these problems, but your job is to fix these problems. That's sometimes what happens as an assistant coach. Sometimes you come into situations where you get handled the first first tackle taken off off the board and another guy who's got some first round upside if it clicks. And sometimes you get handed a room where you have no idea what's going to happen here. He just happens to have both within a two year span here, but he's got to get, he spent the past year developing what was behind Paris Johnson and Dewan Jones and Luke Whipler. And now Two of those three spots he knew 100% he was going to have to replace. And you just add Luke, Luke Whipper to that mix as well. So it's – it's maybe you Tim Walton's in this position too, but, but his is more because of injury situations. We're going to find out whether or not Justin Fry is a good assistant coach or not this year, I think, based off both what he does on the recruiting trail, but then also – what have the guys behind who we knew were going to be the starters last year been doing for the past year, and are they ready to help contribute? That doesn't mean they have to be all-American level. They just can't be so bad that they get in the way of a team trying to win a national championship. 
and Fry may not be a coordinator, but I think it's reasonable to assume that he is going to have a, a greater voice in that room that you wrote about, right. Doug, uh, because of just his background. He was an offensive coordinator before, and not a play calling one, but he's had th- those responsibilities. And, and with, with Wilson vacating, I think he'll have more of a voice there. Also, I think the Tim Walton comparison is an interesting one because it is another room where another position group where the the expectations are high and there's but but there's I feel like people are looking at it they're not looking at it sideways the same way and some of that was what we saw this spring but you you know they were deprived of a starter last year by injury by their their argument that Jordan Hancock would have been a starting caliber cornerback and then they added a guy in Davis and Nick Benoson who even if he isn't a starter is I think probably higher caliber than the two transfers that have been added in the offensive line room as as of where I'm sitting here today. We'll see how that goes. But so there's already been some rep repairing of the problems, the personnel problems in that room, and the jury's still out on whether that happened in the offensive line group. All right, Justin Fry is 10. Nine is Denzel Burke. And I do think part of this equation for Denzel Burke is – what if he's the next first round corner? What if he is the leader that gets this room back to the Ohio State standard at cornerback? And you're not just good, you're great. You're a guy that is making plays on third down. Teams have to change their offensive game plan to avoid you. You have a pick six in a huge game. Like there is an upside here, Steven, I think with Denzel Burke that factors into something like this. That I And, and I think we saw... You know, when he was hurt last year, when he wasn't quite himself, it mattered. Mm-hmm. That, there was a real effect there. And when he got healthy and had his little surgery in the middle of the year, he started to play better, and that had an effect. So I do think we had a – we saw a version of this last year, Stephen, that I think if we were going backwards and saying, who were the 10 most important players slash coaches to Ohio State a year ago, I think you might put Denzel Burke on that list because we saw versions of it. We saw the up and we saw the down. So what do you think of Denzel Burke being ninth here, Stephen? Yeah, I had him 11th, so right outside. And I think the reason he was 11th is because I had the other corners in my top 20. But, yeah, if he's a first-round draft pick, that just – that helps so many places. It helps so many. I mean, we talk about we talk about the, the, the 2010s and how they had all these great edge rushers who were always paired with great corners. You know, Nick Bosa had Denzel Ward. Joey Bosa had Eli Apple. And, you know, I think he had uh, Bradley Roby before a year there. Uh, Chase Young had Jeff Okuda. You know, they, there was always both. The front and the back end worked together. So if there are guys on this front line, whether we're talking about Mike Hall or some of the other guys I'm sure we'll get to on this list, if they're going to be who they're going to be, what helps that is if you've got a first-round corner taking away a side of the field or a guy who can just lock down the other team's best wide receiver. And so they, I, I get why he's in the top ten because it just it eases so much. The better your players are, the more simple you can be and the less, you know, scheme even if Jim Knowles is a schemer if sometimes Jim Knowles' play is hey Denzel lock down your side of the field hey defensive lineman get after the quarterback that's just as smart as scheming up a a a weak side blitz that ends up with a sack Nathan you had Denzel Burke sixth on your list but you actually had a one spot behind Jordan Hancock so you sort of had the second corner slightly ahead of the first corner just how did you view all of that yeah, like I said before about Hancock, it's more that we it, it's still a theory than a a reality. We've seen Denzel Burke play at a high level already, um, and it it wasn't consistent last year by any means. But he was also playing better by the end of the season. I think we saw him start to come around. I think his mentality is going to be pretty critical. Uh, and I, I I usually hesitate to say things like that because you know, I'm not as psychologist or whatever but like he clearly struggled with confidence at times last year and the injury affected that and you saw it show up on the field and what we saw this spring was a guy who looked like he had shed a lot of that and again I just think the two of those guys and I'm 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 high on Igmanosin too and what he might be for this defense but to have two guys like that potentially I mean that you know as well as anyone, Doug, like that was a hallmark of this defense for a long time. It wasn't just like, oh, they've got a pretty good cornerback and they're hoping it comes together on the other side. Like it's like, oh, that guy's going to the NFL, like in a in a high draft pick kind of way. And where are they rotating him in at? And that's a tough standard to emulate. But 
those two guys can be the step back towards that standard, I think. If they come together, if they have the kind of seasons that they we thought they were poised to have last year. Injuries got in the way in both cases. Healthy, both of those guys can – this defense will look different on the field, I think, if both those guys get to opening day healthy because I think they'll be playing with a level of confidence that was deprived of them last year. All right. That's 10. That's nine. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will do number eight, who was number two on my personal list. Next on Buckeye Talk. Doug Lane Maurice, Nathan Baird, Stephen Means. I'm excited to have this conversation because I think we view this differently based on the vote. Who do you think it is that is eighth, Stephen, that I had second? That's eighth overall that I had second. Mm. I would say Marv? Nathan, who do you think it is that's eighth overall that I had second? Boy, there's so many possibilities. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will uh, say, Josh Fryer. Nathan, it's mostly because it's mostly of you. It's mostly because of you. It's Brian Hartline. So I have Brian Hartline number two on my list. And we I have get been it. talking about we have been talking about that this is Ryan Day's offense. It's Ryan Day's offense. All right, you put a guy in. All right. You don't have to come up with a whole new offense. You're kind of just like executing the plan that the boss tells you to execute. But this is what they have done best. This is who they are. This is how they win in the Ryan Day era. This is how they've been a final four team, three of four years. And you are taking the thing they do best, which I think is the correct move. And you are handing it to someone who's never done it. So the idea of, oh, it's great. No difference. And by the way, Ryan Day can do all this other stuff. And it's just as good, maybe even better. What was that play? Oh my gosh, they, they lateraled it 19 times and then they threw it to Marv and he was wide open. Ah, oh, Brian came up with that. Okay, great. Or, wow, that was a weird game plan. Man, those are some weird third down calls against Notre Dame. I don't know. Ryan, what do you think? Well, you know, we're we're working through some stuff. You know, we've just got to, we got to make sure we're on the same page. And week six, Ryan Day announces that he's calling plays again. I think both those are on the table. I don't think the second one is particularly a huge percentage chance of it happening. I don't think it's impossible. And by the way, the guy they just handed the stuff to, number two on my list, just kind of had a thing. I don't think that is going to be, I don't think Brian Hartline having an accident on his property Whatever charges come or don't come out of that, I, I don't think that's going to blow a hole in the season. That's not, I would have him second on this list regardless of that. But it's a little wrinkle, it's like a little speed bump here in the beginning of this, Nathan. So when you're changing what you do best, even if you're kind of sure that it's going to still be good, the possibility that it's not, even if it's only a 5% or 10% chance, and the upside of what we've talked about a lot, maybe too much. I'm just infatuated with it. Like this guy, Ryan Day, was born to call plays. Everything he did at Manchester High and the University of New Hampshire wasn't trying to, he wasn't never going to be the next Tom Brady. It was creating this, this guy. And maybe it helped him be a leader and be a culture guy. It was brain training to be an offensive play caller. And he's going to let someone else do it on Saturdays. Holy moly. That's why. Nathan, that's why I have Brian Hartline second, because you're winning, you're on your hand. And it's like the babysitter. It's like, hey, new parent, Nathan Baird, how high is the first time babysitter on your list of important people in your life? Hey, babe, we're, yeah, we're, I got a good recommendation from the neighbor. The wife and I are going to a, Haley and I are going to a movie. Here, here's Bennett. How high is that babysitter? Like, you know, it's, it's fine. I, this is a terrible example. <laughs> I'm like, hey, Nathan, what if you have a babysitter and it goes terribly? 
It's like, great, yeah. fun. Let's have real life examples for a football discussion. That's yeah. going to put a knot in your stomach. It's fine. <laughs> Babysitter's fine. But you know what I mean? Ryan Day's handing over his baby and his baby's the offense. And even if it 99.99999% fine, you're still a little nervous about it. Maybe first time. What do you think, Nathan? Do I have him too high? Uh, so I had him down in the, the teens and I'm thinking that was probably too low. However, I don't think I would have put him. I don't think I would have put him second, but I'm, I'm talking myself into having him too low. And it's this, like one of the reasons why I put him that low is because I'm not convinced he is turning the offense over to him yet. And I don't know if the incident in question will affect that, but we also didn't see for sure this spring, you know, it was something, yeah, we're trying it. Yeah. He's going to do it. It's certainly what he wants to do long-term. Will he get there this year? I don't know, but I think you could probably argue that if you get to opening day and Ryan day says, we're not ready for that yet. I'm keeping the play calling. Then that emphasizes the fact that Brian Hartline deserves to be that high on that list because either he wasn't ready or Ryan Day decided he wasn't ready or he wasn't ready to give it up. I don't know. But like everything we've talked about, so many of the things we've talked about that are potential massaging out some of the wrinkles that have tripped Ohio State up these last couple of years, trace back potentially to Ryan Day easing off the reins and letting someone else be, do the play calling and whatever time that can free him up during the week to just uh, oversight a couple things, um, pressure test more things, get things set for that Saturday that isn't just building that game plan in quite the same detail. And if that doesn't happen this year, there could be ramifications on the field. But that, but that also Good maybe... Morning traces back to how high you put Ryan Day relative to how high you put Brian Hartline. Steven, is, too, is do I have him way too high? I get it. You have him too high, though. I had a 10th. Um, I think he deserves to be on the top 10 because he goes both ways. What if he's not good at it? Like, Brian Day has to find ways to create time for himself in a work week at this point. In, in what college football is, your head coach has to find time to do head coach stuff. And if Brian Hartline can take, can is not good at this, and so while now we're back where we were a year ago, where instead of maybe focusing on that Michigan game, or maybe focusing on, hey, um, Tyreek Williams isn't happy with how many snaps he's getting, or he's having a bad week, and he just wants to come hang out in the coach's office for a couple of hours, but he can't do that because Brian Hartline's got to be in on the, the, the offensive staff meeting and the game plan meeting. That's all he's got to find time to do other stuff. But also, it's what if Brian Hartline's awesome at it? You know, so far, it feels it's, like you're it, making, but you're making the case for number two. No, sounds, I, I, I agree. You're saying it all. Yeah. I, yes. Yeah. What if he's great? What if he's not? I love it. Yes. Big gap. It's really like, important. <laughs> I don't think it's that, but I don't think the, the, the answer to this is like, oh, he should be number two. I think maybe if you wanted to put him six or seven, I'd understand that because I don't think he is the most valuable uh, coordinator still, even if he is awesome at it, because there is another guy who is still the head coach of the defense per Ryan Day's words. But there is a two very bit much extremes here of what if he's not good at it and we're back where we were a year ago, but also what if he's awesome at it? And then like Brian Hartline is just one of the best play callers in the country because which is like a, it's a crazy thing to say, except this dude had never been a position coach and now he's probably the best wide receivers coach in the country in five years. So both of those are on the table. Okay. This one is interesting because there's a gap here. So Heartline was eighth. Seventh is the right tackle. And this was, again, one of the two places where we lumped people together. And the reason this is interesting is because, Stephen, you had this fourth on your list. Mm -hmm. And Nathan, you had this 17th on your list. So that's a big gap. That's an interesting discussion point. Stephen, why did you have right tackle in the top five for you? I think both tackle spots need to be in the top five because all this other stuff is great. If they can't block, especially pass block, for a team who's got this, these weapons and these quarterbacks who we think will be pretty good, that doesn't matter. You know, they, I, I, it's, it's, it's imperative that they're good. I don't think they have to, if they're elite, great. Obviously, anytime you can get elite, that's great. It is imperative that this offensive line is at bare minimum good. It has to be because if it's good, if the offensive line is just good, 
I think everything else can be elite because they're already elite talents. Nathan, why did you have right tackle low in the teens? Um, a few reasons. Number one is uh, some deference to left tackle being more crucial than right tackle. Uh, the other being that just the abundance of options that they have now, which is the two guys who were competing this spring, plus you add Josh Simmons to that, plus you've still got Josh Fryer. Like if they decide things aren't working out at left tackle for him, he probably just slides over and starts at right tackle. I mean, that's where we had always kind of projected, and that's where he even did sub in last year as a starter for Dewan Jones. So I, I'm i more confident in there being a, um, a competent solution on the roster now. Again, they've got so many shots at it. They've got to find one of those three-plus people that can that can handle that job. Um, I'm just more confident in that and the ramifications of it being just sort of okay are not as grave as on the left side. So maybe there is an opportunity here for right tackles gap as we see it right now to not be as wide as a couple other places. Cause it, like, are they going to have an all American right tackle? No, but do they have enough options now that it's, Probably not going to be a complete and utter disaster. Well, you know, the more guys you add in there, you increase the chances that it won't be an utter disaster. So then if you kind of are fairly certain it's going to be fine, some version of fine, good enough, and you have a little bit of belief there, I think you can move it down the list. The more you doubt that they'll find some version of find the higher up the list it goes so if josh simmons does not increase your fine index quite a bit then it's like wow like they might not have a big 10 level right tackle get back to me when the common core is running for his life right like that's okay or like it'll it'll be good enough most likely and i think either of those are on the table i think they're either i i don't I don't think either of you guys are wrong with this, but I think it's interesting to talk about there because there are people out there, Stephen, who view who view it like you do, who are like, mm -hmm. I, I'm like right tackle keeps me awake at night. And then, Nathan, I think there are people who view it like you do, particularly after the addition of Josh Simmons, where it's like, I think it'll it, it'll find a way to be good enough. Right. There's a, three options there or or Fryer. Like, I, I, I'm not going to put it at the top 10 because. It'll be okay in the end, but Stephen, you're you're more towards sleepless nights. Yeah, uh, and I, I I've I think part of it is the style of quarterbacks we're talking about here. If if Justin Fields was your quarterback in this situation, even if like he was the first year starting quarterback, we know he's an athlete, athletic freak. Even if the other stuff wouldn't have known, I might have put tackle lower, just because it's like the Michigan State game. Hey, Justin, they can't block for you, so just run, just just take off. But they don't have that at quarterback, even with what Devin Brown brings to the table. And because that's not the case, um, it's like it, it, it was that's what I was saying earlier. The the more elite the guys are around you, the less you know, the further away from good the other parts have to be. And so, because you don't have this elite athlete at quarterback who could just fix a problem with his legs, or you don't have a second year starting CJ Stroud who identifies the problem pre snap and the balls out of his hands before it becomes even a problem at all. I think it raises the level of concern in a way that you know it might decrease after we get two or three games into the season. But because we don't know so much about other stuff, you have to take every flaw or every worry that you have about any other situation and almost like multiply it by two or three just to be safe. Who were you closer to, Doug? I had the right tackle at ninth. So like, oh, like right in the middle directly. <laughs> oh, okay. Between you guys like in the top 10, but like not quite sleepless nights, but you know, so, so yeah, that's why you, the two of you were more interesting conversation because you were on two ends and uh, I'm just hanging out in the middle. All right, let's do number six. Nathan, I'll start with you here because you had this guy highest among us. He's number six overall. He's number four on your list, Nathan. It's JT Tui Molo. Wow. Why did you have JT as high as you did, Nathan? 
the he's the guy who can be the game wrecker. And we saw him do it once in a very obvious way against Penn State last year. We saw him approach it in other ways. And it's, again, guys whose single performance can reverberate through the whole offense, defense, whatever, um, if they're if they're stepping their game up. Like, we already know what Marvin Harrison Jr. is. But this is a guy who hasn't consistently played at that level, but has given you a taste of it. And if it shows up with any something, any semblance more consistency, now you're just talking about a different defense. Like that changes the defense. And when you, we're going to talk about maybe Jim Knowles at some point on this list. I don't know. I'm, I know that that's someone that people were probably going to put pretty high. Um, but the better JT Tuomaloa plays, the lower uh, I think Jim Knowles slides on a list like this. You know what I'm saying? Like if if you've got a guy out there who is just uh, is just uh, wrecking the game. I mean, I know that that's the cliche that we use, but when he is out there doing things that no one else can do, um, it, it's a weapon that uh, few teams really get to deploy. And Ohio State has been searching for it now for going on four seasons. Well, three seasons, 2019 being the last one. This will be the fourth season. And I think you could probably even argue that Maybe to be at the elite of this sport, you've got to find your way back to that. Because the teams that they keep running into at the next level, whether that's um, Michigan, whether that's Will Anderson, they didn't quite, I guess, get to play Will Anderson, whether it's the Jalen Carters of the world, like those teams tend to find these guys and develop these guys. So can he make the, can he finish off his development towards that? You had him fourth, I had him fifth. The Texers had him eighth. Steven, you had him ninth. Nathan, the Texters and I had him as the highest defensive players on our list. Steven, you had him one spot behind Tommy Eichenberg, but it's close. It's like we're we're all talking about JT, I think, Steven, in basically the same way that, again, if we went backwards, if JT is not around, do they beat Penn State last year? Probably not. Maybe maybe Marv still Marv's Joey Porter Jr. a couple more times, but you could maybe point to that. They made the playoffs, Stephen. But if they don't make, beat Penn State, Ohio State's not making the playoff. And they might not beat Penn State. Maybe, maybe there's no might without JT. So it's like, oh, well, how do you assess value? Okay, that. He'd be top 10 if you look backward. And now we look forward, and Stephen, is that the kind of conversation that we have? Are there when you were ranking guys on this team who have a chance to kind of win a game by themselves? JT winds up pretty high on that list. Yeah, I, the Penn State game is JT started playing with his hair on fire in the fourth quarter, and all of a sudden Ohio State scored like twenty-one points in a span of like six minutes. Why? I mean, because he's getting picks, he's getting strip sacks and everything else you can think of. Like the first two plays that he, that he had are great, but that's early in the game. You're still filling each other out. The fact that it was very Chase Young, Penn State 2019-ish, where it's like anytime you needed Chase to do something, Chase did something. And it was the same thing with JT. I don't, I, I, the reason I had Tommy ahead of him is because of what, what Knowles thinks of Tommy Eikenberg. But Tommy can just be that this year. If Tommy Eikenberg ends up being like the eighth best player on this team this year, that's fine. I think JT needs to be in a conversation to be one of the best players in the country, period. And they need that. They need a dude who at the end of the year we're going, is JT a finalist for the Nagurski Award and the La Impact Award and all? Not hot has been, that's a whole different conversation, but he needs to be in that conversation. And we did the draft pod, and Nathan and I both had him, I think, in the top 15 or top 10 of that. They need that from him this year. They need, because we're talking about Denzel Burke, pair that with a crazy year from JT where it's a 10 sack season, or even if it's like an eight sack season, but because of the way he plays, he's got like two or three interceptions, a bunch of strip sacks, and he's just wrecking things in the backfield. They haven't had a guy who has allowed defensive coordinators to not coach so much these last couple of years. And when you're as talented as Ohio state, your coordinators have to be good. I'm not saying they don't, but we need to get back to a space where Doug's, um, Ohio State assistant coaches are just middle managers. We need to get back to having that conversation, and you get there by having players who make your coaches look better than they actually are. Number 10, Justin Fry. Number 9, Denzel Burke. Number 8, Brian Hartline. Number 7, the right tackles. And number 6, JT Tuimolo. Wow. 
we're going to stop this pod there. And we're going to do our top five on another pod. We're not trying to tease you. We're just trying to give your brain a break because an hour is enough of that. And then this will allow us with those five guys to, to really dive in on who are the make or break people for this 2023 Ohio State season. So thanks to the texters who voted in that. Again, if you want to be part of that, 614-350-3315. And then uh, it's a two-week free trial, and it's very easy to stop. If you want to stop, you just type the word stop, and then you're out, and you're done paying. We're not here to like take money that you don't want to give us. So we'll come back with the top five for now. For Stephen Means and for Nathan Baird, I'm Doug Maurice, and that was Buckeye Talk.